Hey everybody, it's great to see you today. Welcome to Living Power, your online Bible study. We are walking through the Bible in a year, and I want to commend you if you have been with me from the beginning and you are still reading. I just want to just give you a word of encouragement and tell you, well done, because I know it gets difficult in the summer to stay with it. And if you are able to stick with the Bible reading, I just wanted to uh, to commend you for this wonderful achievement. The next big hump many of you will have to um, sort of overcome is the schedule change back into the fall routine when school starts again. So um, you know, if we can get through that last uh, little uh, schedule change that many of us have, then we'll be on the home stretch through the fall, then to the end um, of the Bible, and we will have read the whole Bible in a year. So, thank you so much for your faithfulness to the study. Thank you for being a blessing to me and encouraging me because this was something that I really wanted to achieve with God's help this year is walking through the Bible studying in depth each chapter and you are uh, my inspiration and you're encouraging me to do that and you're the reason why I'm doing that. So I'm just just thankful that we are on this study together uh, this year. Today we are studying the book of Micah and we're in Micah chapter 6 and um, we, we cover Micah just a little bit and then we go back into the history books actually and we see that Assyria comes against Judah and it's about 703 BC and um, between 703 and 701 we have this, um, this terrible threat against Jerusalem and um, we'll, we'll get there today and we've been kind of talking about that off and on for the past week or so, but we actually read about that today where Assyria comes in and uh, invades Judah. In Micah, however, we, we see this, you know, repeat summary. Boy, you know, when, when God has something to say, he makes sure he says it. When he has something to say more than once, when he repeats himself, it means it's super important. And we keep seeing the same summary, don't we, with, um, with Israel. Israel having sinned, and today we see a little bit into the person of God where he says, you know, what have I done to you? What have I done to make you get tired of me? Answer me. And we can see just the frustration in him. You know, God has emotions just like we do. That's part of being made in, in his image. And he is saying, why? You know, I've been so good to you. Why? And he goes on and he lists their sins and he says that Israel must be punished. And he says, but there will come a day when Israel will live in the land. Their borders will be extended fully and the people will of all the nations will honor Israel. Boy, won't that be different from how life is today. And it says Jesus will do miracles for them like he did for the Israelites in the desert when they were moving through the wilderness. And in Micah 7 verse 16, I love this verse. I bet you do too. It says nations will stand amazed at the amazing works that the Lord will do for Israel. You know, he's going to part the Red Sea a second time. And that is so that the exiles can return back to their land. And of course, that hasn't happened yet. So that is as much as we're going to talk about Micah today. We do get into 2 Chronicles, 2 Kings, and Isaiah. And don't you love the chronological layout? Because it really shows you that there's a repeat. You know, it looked like we had a lot of reading to do today, but when you really got down to it, the story was repeated in two additional places in Scripture. And the story of uh, Hezekiah and how he was fortifying some of the city walls and how he was building tunnels and thinking about, you know, the water um, coming into the city. And then in, well, in, in Second Chronicles, he gives this encouraging message and it reminded me of Joshua. Didn't it remind you of Joshua? Remember when the Israelites were in the um, wilderness and they were about to fight their first fight and Joshua was just, be encouraged, the Lord is with us. You remember that? Um, 
Second Chronicles tells us that Hezekiah was that way. Be strong and courageous. I'm in Second Chronicles 32, verse 7. Don't be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria or his mighty army, for there is a power far greater on our side. He may have a great army, but they are merely men. We have the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles for us. Amen. I put a big circle around that. I love that. Um, and it says, his words greatly encourage the people. And you remember, we talked about Second Chronicles and Second Kings repeating things, but giving us a different perspective. Chronicles gives us God's perspective, and Kings gives us man's perspective. So, interesting in the Second Kings passage, we don't see this... Um, speech of encouragement here. And here we see more about what's happening between the men. Uh, so it's more of a fleshly happening rather than what's happening on the spiritual level. Here in Second Kings it tells us that the king of Assyria was so bold to demand 11 tons of silver and one ton of gold. And Hezekiah scrambled around to Get the silver and get the gold off of parts of the temple. Wow, what did you think when you read that? I could not, I could not imagine that. He says, to gather this amount, 2 Kings 18.15. Hezekiah, King Hezekiah used all the silver stored in the temple of the Lord and in the palace treasury. Whew, that's a lot. Hezekiah even stripped the gold from the doors of the temple and from the doorposts he had overlaid with gold and he gave it all to the Assyrian king. So on one hand, he's saying, let's be strong, the Lord is with us. And on the other hand, he's giving the king of Assyria everything he is demanding, and he's taking it from the temple to pay this king tribute. How often do we in our lives do the same thing? We give lip service to God, but our actions say that we have to save ourselves and that God is not there to save us and that we have to come up with a solution to our problems. Wow, I couldn't believe this. This is such a contrast. But don't we do it? I bet you can think of a time in your life where you really wanted to trust God, but if somebody didn't know you and know that you were a Christian and know that you had the faith that you have and they were just l observing you by your actions, they might not have thought that you even knew God at all. I wonder if we can think of a time like that in our life. And so did, did it help? I mean, we're going to see in the next couple of days what actually happens. Does the king of Assyria come in and capture Judah. All of this tribute money that he's giving away, it sounds like he's just wiping out the treasury, doesn't it? I mean, what, what is it for? We're going to see over the next couple of days. And the king of Assyria isn't even here. He's not even on the battleground. He's back at home. He sent his chief of staff to come. And I was studying this time through some of the things that the chief of staff said. Did you notice? Now, this is the, this is the enemy speaking this to Israel. What are you trusting in? Are you trusting in your words, trying to negotiate with us? Or are you trusting in your God? You should trust in military power and strength. And this is coming from 2 Kings 18, verse 20. Now, you and I know that this is just totally anti how God thinks. God, you know, has said in other parts of Scripture, don't trust in your horses, don't trust in your military, don't trust in your money, don't trust in your power, trust in me. So it's interesting, the perspective. I mean, they, they don't have a Judeo-Christian perspective, do they? Obviously. Here's something else that the chief of staff of the Assyrians say. Come out, and I will take you to a new land. So, I mean, he never lies to them. It appears that the, the whole concept of the exile is kind of laid out there right in front of them. But Hezekiah tells them to be quiet, and they're not to speak, and they don't. They do not respond to these things. But I think the thing that really caused God to act more than any of their taunts, 
more than any of the danger, more than any of the disrespect against Israel, was when the chief of staff said in Isaiah 36, 18 to 20, Did any God rescue Samaria? What God of any nation has ever been able to save its people from us? The Assyrians are saying this. So what makes you think that the Lord can rescue Jerusalem from me? What arrogance. Does he not know he is speaking this against the God of Israel, against the God of the whole earth? He obviously doesn't understand who God is. He obviously has no respect for who God is. And I just think that might have done it because you're going to read, I think it's tomorrow, that Jesus comes in a mighty way and takes them out just like that. And I wonder if it didn't have something to do with these haughty words that just speak so little of our God, how strong he is, how much he loves Israel, and how ever-present he is. So after tomorrow's reading, the Assyrians are sure to think, you would think that they would think different about the God of Israel. Well, I'm going to encourage you now, we're going to quit, and I'm going to encourage you to continue in your reading over the next couple of days. See what, see if God doesn't show up in a big way coming in here to save um, to save Jerusalem for, for destruction because her time has not yet come. So I hope you have you are enjoying this um, walk through Isaiah. It's just an incredible book. Here we are back in the history books today, um, dabbling into Isaiah, and we're going continue, um, to continue in that. It just keeps getting better and better. So blessings to you and your family. I just um, pray blessings over you this day. Thank you so much for being with me and your continued faith to the Bible study. Shalom. Shalom.